Hello and welcome to our last week here together in the Psychology of Personality, week 15. And we're going to be covering our last two chapters, chapters 19 and 20. So let's get started. So chapter 19 is about the cognitive perspectives on personality development. And I get right into one of my favorite theorists here, the Jean Piaget, and his development of the theory of genetic epistemology. Now, genetic epistemology, the actual phrase, refers to genetic, not genes, but the genesis, the creation or construction of an epidemiology is ways of knowing, a philosophical term. So, um, not epidemiology, sorry. I have COVID on the head. It's epistemology, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to keep that in the video because it's just funny. So genetic epistemology. Epistemology is ways of knowing and that's from philosophy. And genetic really refers to the genesis or the creation of that. And it really gets into the idea of cognitive psychology. One of the leading theory in cognitive psychology is what we call constructivism. Now, constructivism is that we construct internal representations of the external world inside of us, including representations of ourself that express themselves in our personality, hence this chapter, and that those representations are called schemas. And that's sort of what Piaget brought to us, along with a developmental model about the increasingly complex and abstract nature of that over time through the, his stages of development. <clears throat> So he's a great cognitive theorist, along with being a great developmental psychologist. Now, people took that, like this person, George Kelly, took that and went ape on it, just to talk about all kinds of different schemas. And the, the course book goes over that along with your... Um, along with your textbook, really building on this idea of schemas that create who we are, as a, the, the internal representations of who we are. I see this as pieces of our puzzle pieces. These are individual pieces that we construct. So there's, there's the, the construction corollary, individuality corollary, organization category corollary, dichotomies, choice, range, experience, modulation, fragmentation, commonality and sociality corollary. This is, I see these and it's worthy of further study before I put my book out, is to look at each one of these as ways in which we construct our personality in relation to information. Again, going back to Piaget, uh, Piaget operated on two principles of accommodation and assimilation, that we are constantly accommodating our internal schemas to new information and assimilating new information at the same time. So this is very, very dynamic aspects of who we are coming from this particular theory. So we have that model built upon um, Piaget's work. And then we have probably one of the most, uh, you know, there's, there's very cool and very descriptive ways of thinking about the personality, which is a lot like what Puzzle Pieces is about. And then there are really useful ways of describing the personality that have stood the test of time. You know, when we look at, let's say, um, Maslow's hierarchy or the triangular theory of love, and, and we see those it just solid, solid models that we can use, not only to describe, but really to impact and help people along and, and, and you know, basically to treat people who might be having problems. And along comes Albert Ellis, one of my favorite theorists of all time, and his notion of a personality that has gone awry that has to do with the rationality or irrationality of our belief systems. And he developed a model called rational emotive therapy that there's probably not a real lot of people that, you know, do strictly RET type work. But in the, in the 
cornucopia of tools that therapists have, almost certainly they use some of the, or they definitely encounter these kinds of ideas. And these are irrational beliefs that we have incorporated in as schemas into our lives. And we, they're belief systems. So we are strongly emotionally attached to these things, but they're irrational. They have no basis in reality. They're unachievable, and therefore, because we believe them nonetheless, they almost invariably lead to pain and frustration and depression. And I listed a whole bunch of them here, and just really quickly, they're in the course book, but fun to talk about. It is a dire necessity for adult humans to be loved and approved by everybody. Do you know anybody who has that belief? One absolutely must be competent, adequate, and achieving in all important respects. Can't fail. People absolutely must act considerately and fairly. Do you know anybody like the world's unfair? You know, the, you know everything should go this way. Why do, these, why do people cut me off all the time? You know, those kind. It is an awful and terrible when things are not the way one would like them to be. Emotional disturbance is mainly externally caused by others rather than internally. My interpretation is sort of an external locus of that control. If something is or may be dangerous or fearsome, then one should be constantly and excessively concerned about it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to perseverate. I'm just going to worry, 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 worry. One cannot and must not face life's responsibilities and difficulties, and it is easier to avoid them. Just keep them, that might combine with the, the one where you can't fail. And this is actually where procrastination comes from, just a little hint that if I can't fail, I have that mindset, then my ability would be to not do it, which would align with this, I will, I will avoid it, and I will fail, but it will not be because of my actual actions. It will be the lack of actions. And therefore, for some odd reason, we can come to the conclusion that it wasn't me. Because had I done it, I would have done fine. So I can escape. I can fail. And, and at the same time, escape the experience of failure. Oh, the human mind. So great. One must be quite dependent on others and need them, and you cannot mainly run your own life. One's past history is an all-important determinator as to who you are today. Widespread and sometimes very validated by therapists. Other people's disturbances are horrible, and one must feel upset about them. I have this sort of like the boundary issues, you know, when somebody else is going through a hard time. And finally... There is an invariable, a right, precise, and perfect solution to all human problems. Right. That is not true. Okay. So, here we have, it's a, we're not quite into personality disorders yet. We're going to get into that. But we have this model. We have the schema model. And then we have these, these, it really fits in this chapter because these are schemas. These are ideas that people have that shape Let's go through that list, and I, I can name a person, myself included, that has a bit of some of those. Of each one, I can attach them to a person, including myself. And so, really, really important determinants of our, um, of our personalities. We may see this kind of addressing some of these issues when we see people engaging in cognitive behavior therapy, CBT, that's more commonly known, uh, where the, the B is belief system. A little creative. So rather than behavior, like you have antecedents, behavior, consequence, in, C, in CBT, you have antecedents, belief systems, consequences. And what we have to recognize from the behavioral standpoint, take a behavioral perspective of Ellis's irrational beliefs, these exist because they're reinforcing. So an individual, let's say, 
who says my past history defines me will share their particular traumas and why it gets in the way of their success and it will bring people to them to support them and maintain that belief system there is no doubt that trauma impacts us but it is not a prison but a person can develop a belief system that creates their own prison and they can certainly gather people around them and we particularly see this in social media if somebody a lot well there's i won't say a lot there's well there's probably a lot of people will use social media because i almost guaranteed if somebody puts out their story on social media they will not only gather appropriate support but they'll gather sympathy support and so the sympathy support will go you know that's support whatever angle and they'll just unfriend the people that don't give them what they want now in truth and you'll probably never see this in there you'll never see this on facebook but you might see it in therapy but after a, after a while of presenting a person's historical history and its barriers on their current life eventually the therapist has to say hey you need to stop using that as a reason for not taking steps forward have you ever seen somebody post that? Probably never. It's inappropriate to do therapy on Facebook. So, no. Hopefully some people have reached out. I know I've reached out. It's a risk-taking behavior. Certainly it's something that you'd want somebody to do in the safety of the therapy environment. That is not the place Facebook and with your friends and with your family is not the place to do that. But certainly that is the thing that some people may need in order to break out of this irrational thinking. So, we end this chapter. We look at the discussion, and there's an assignment. So the discussion, I want you to look at rationally motivated behavior therapy is based on ABC, theory of personality. Can you think of situations and acting events led you to specific consequences even though your beliefs if you thought about them enough, were the real reason for the consequences you expected. Basically, do you identify with any of those things? And, or, you know, you don't have to self-disclose. I ask for a lot of self-disclosure. I can probably should tame that down a little bit. But the, you know, just come up with a story and just say, I have a friend. Could be you, but you have a friend. Or you just use somebody else. That's fine. And, um, and you know, kind of discuss how that irrational thought was really sort of the situation that was going on. And finally, in the, in the theory that we uh, looked at for schemas, a person's role in their society, which creates all of these schemas, their multiplicity of roles, it's actually an assignment I do in my sociology class, we actually create a chart that shows all the different groups that they belong to, what their role and status is in that group, you know, kind of thing, and how that creates a picture of their personality. You know, it's like, who do you hang out with? What do you do? What are your activities? Are you a student? Are you in this? And in fact, if somebody, we would maybe describe our personality using all of our traits or personality types that we've been learning all this time and our, certainly our culture and whatnot, but we would also identify all the groups that we belong to, our hobbies, our connections with other people, our, our likes, dislikes, our political affiliations. We would th throw those in, and we're kind of capturing that here with that assignment. So, And there's an app to use, so you can experiment with that and s submit that, kind of create an organizational chart of your social connections. And we end on Chapter 20, Personality Disorders, and I spend a little bit of time telling you a story of my personal experience with a person with multiple personality disorder, Lorna Dunn, who is no longer with us, and, uh, but had a, quite an impact on my early career. And so um, I share that with you because I was a disbeliever up until that time of multiple personality disorder. Uh, or complex post-traumatic stress disorder, or you know the the different the things along the continuity of um, the ability to dissociate. And th this is uh, when I, when I was in graduate school, uh, dissociative disorders were sort of what I focused all my work on, and uh, particularly borderline personality and multiple personality disorder. 
and um, these kinds of experiences were very, very um, profound. So what we what we sort of examine, you know, with the case study of Lorna, but also bring to light the idea that there is a um, they don't use them uh, as a separate category inside of the DSM now. The DSM-5 mixes the personality disorders with the other major illnesses, major mental illnesses. But there are personality disorders, we still talk about them as personality disorders, that are defined by the DSM. And the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual outlines the criteria for someone in order for them to achieve that diagnosis. And so when you are engaged in the process of diagnosing a personality disorder, you are collecting data, medical, historical, psychosocial, behavioral, observational, substance use, you know, you're collecting all of that information and you're sort of eliminating things. Well, it's not this, it's not this it's called differential diagnosis. You just kind of eliminating and what you're left with. It's very deductive reasoning, similar to Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes that he just eliminated. His purpose was to, to make people innocent and what you're left with is the person that had to do it. And so, so you just kind of eliminate through that and then you're left with the people, person who meets a certain number of those criteria for a certain amount of time, then we have a label in order to help that person and connect them with recommended treatment and recommended medications and whatnot. So that's one model, is this notion of the DSM-5 and the medical establishment and, and, and those. And the real value of that has been the value and the Achilles heel has been the medicalization of mental illnesses. Now, meta, the, meaning that their brain disorders, their imbalances and whatnot, it rem for, in one way, it removes the stigma of a person's uh, behavior being faked or uh, they just don't have enough willpower or they're, you know, whatever, those kinds of ways that we're there or possessed by spirits or something like that. And yet, while it has eliminated the stigma associated with that in the um, medical community, it has not necessarily spread to the rest of the community. It still seems that the brain gets hijacked, it's unpredictable, uncontrollable, and all those things. So along with that medical model, there's been some uh, new levels of stigma that have come around about that. Ne and stigma meaning a negative social connotation of a person having a mental illness. I mean, it's pretty clear that there's a stigma associated with mental illness that's not associated with some other diseases like cancer. I could be in a classroom and I could say, show, show of hands, how many people here uh, have cancer, have had cancer and you're a survivor? And people would raise their hand and be, I had it, survived, you know, blah, blah, blah. They'd be proud of that. They would be, even individuals who have currently had cancer would raise their hands as I'm currently fighting cancer and that they could get support for that. If I asked the same question about schizophrenia, I would not, I would hope, might get some answers, but I would, chances are most people would not raise their hand. It's not one of those things that we share because there's a stigma associated with it. It's not something that we want to wear a badge about. And so the DSM has had that sort of mixed ability to it. What we get introduced to in our textbook is Millen's evolutionary model, where, where it takes sort of a different view on mental illness as a product of maladaptive adaptation. Basically, and this is, to me, this rings very true in terms of um, psychosocial rehab. So in my view in psychosocial rehab, and some of you might be in the rehab program, here at UMA, but the, um, the idea is that I've always had the, the principle that the diagnosis really doesn't matter because what I focus on is how the person interacts and adapts to living in the environment of their choice. So given that the individual has symptoms arising from their mental illness, got it, all over that. We collect that information, we understand 
these symptoms exist. They may manifest in different settings, and depending on the setting and the degree of the manifestation, they will create barriers for that individual to function in the environment of their choice. How they adapt to that, either through self behavior and things that they do, the way they manage their lives, or through advocacy and changing the environment, which is a lot of what social workers do, that will determine the outcome, not the presence or absence of particular symptoms. So I really have a lot of alignment with Millen's environmental models. So the person, so, so we, we get into uh, the personality adapts to ensure existence. Okay, person adaptation, person cannot survive if it cannot adapt. Replication, person can survive over time by having offspring, this, this is evolutionary thing. Abstraction, the ability to plan and make good choices. All of us develop personality structures to meet these needs. These are the needs that he has. Then he goes into the different ways in which people fail to adapt well, but I have to emphasize they it's very likely that the adaptation was appropriate at one time, but then it became habitual. So the habit of, let's say with the repeated trauma associated with MPD or dissociative identity disorder as it's known now, very often associated with multiple repeated, almost ritualized abuse and often sexual abuse, often incestual sexual abuse. Extremely traumatic. As a young person, the individual's ability to dissociate was incredibly adaptive to limit the actual physical, physical experience that they were going through to go into another place and had that capacity allowed them to survive as we see as a basic need and the adaptation that was there. Because the trauma was so intense, it habitualized that, ad had that adaptation. Now that ad adaptation for when you're in that situation is obviously very appropriate, but it's not appropriate during an interview as an adult later on. And I'm not being facetious about that. It is simply that that behavior under strain that continues to happen in situations when a person is not in strain is maladaptive. So we can kind of look at some of these personality habits and choices and patterns in people's behavior that they have picked, and we kind of get the other angle on the DSM-5. We have these symptoms that come about organically, but then we have these maladaptive pieces, and the maladaptive things, social workers can actually do something about that. We can't do anything directly at least, we can do meds, we can do therapy, we can do exercise, we can do appropriate eating and whatnot to help with the chemical imbalances and the, and, you know, the, the mental illness that is going on. But sometimes we have to address these maladaptions. So here we have a whole, a whole, flu of, uh, a whole slew of them, uh, pleasure deficient personalities, individuals who lack the ability to experience joy because that's how they adapted to the situation they're in interpersonally imbalanced, a condition in which disordered individuals are either overly disposed to orient themselves toward fulfilling the needs of others or overly inclined to meet their own selfish needs. Intrapsychically conflicted personalities, individuals whose internal orientations move in opposite directions. They're at war with themselves. Boy, I can name a few clients with that. Structural defective personalities, much more deeply embedded disorders that affect the function of the mind itself. Thus, the disorders in this final category are considered more severe than in the ones before. This is extremely cool, useful stuff. Useful to help people to understand not just the presence of a personality disorder, or even a major mental illness like schizophrenia, depression, those are not personality disorders, but even all the mental illnesses. But then we look at adaptation and we see where do things go wrong and how did that become habitualized primarily in the face of trauma. 
So, and trauma at any age. It could be an individual who experienced 9-11, the people who has been at war, individuals who were abused as children, people that were abused in marital relationships, people who have lost their jobs unfairly, people who are, have COVID, people who, people who are right now is actually increasing, not, not necessarily in diagnosable mental illness, although that's true, that, that has been increasing, but increased depression, increased anxiety, increased all of, all of these things. And how well are people doing in COVID in days right now? How, how well are people doing? In terms, are they maladapting or are they adapting well to those situations? So when we look at the adaptation instead of the symptoms, we're on a good track to helping that individual. Only have one last discussion for chapter 20, and that is has to do with Millen's theory has suggested that people with personality disorders have adapted in predictable ways to abusive, neglectful environments specifically. Do you know anyone who seems to have serious personality problems that appear to reflect these models that we've had here? So that, or as I said, that, that they were how they were raised or the environment in which they grew up. Um, be gentle with this. We do not want to reveal names. We do, do not need to self-disclose. If this is an uncomfortable topic, you don't even have to participate. It's just one discussion. Everything is optional. So please uh, tread lightly on this last uh, discussion. It's a deep topic and very significant to a lot of people and be kind to each other as we should have been all semester and as you have been. Um, okay, this is the last little video. I will be doing one more to end the class at the end of the week. And uh, I look forward to these two discussions and to grading your auto ethnographies. I'm looking forward to that. I've been hearing from some people about what they're going to do and some excitement there. I know it's stressful, but nonetheless, some excitement about a paper all about who you are. So I will see you this week and have a great week.